We're going to do something today that we don't usually do. Today's cancellation is going to be something of a sequel to yesterday's. On Wednesday, as you know, we talked about the issue of high body counts. Specifically, we discussed why men care about a woman's body count, how many men she slept with, and why it's valid for us to care about it, and why, in fact, we should care about it. We're not going to rehash that topic. You can go back to yesterday's show and listen or find the clip on YouTube. Uh, that segment got a, a pretty big reaction, and, and as they say, sparked a conversation. Many people, both men and women, agreed with the points that I raised. Some disagreed. And then there was, as expected, a loud minority of people who, who didn't disagree necessarily with the substance of my remarks, but who nonetheless had a problem with the focus of my remarks. I spent most of the segment talking about why women shouldn't have high body counts. But why didn't I say more about why men shouldn't have high body counts? So let me read a few of these comments and messages, and I think this is a representative sample. Matt, you dropped the ball on the body count rant. Everything you said about women's body counts is true, but it's just as bad for men who have high body counts. It's just as much of a red flag. You can't let men off the hook. Another says, Matt, Matt says nothing about men having a high body count. It's just as bad for men to have a high body count and all the negative things he said uh, women having a, bi- about a high body count apply to men. This one-sided conversation is stupid. Another says, number one, the association between STDs and sexual experience is valid for both men and women. Number two, the argument about habit of following carnal desire holds both for men and women. Number three, as for moral and values, only women's morals and values are called into question. Number four, desired self-control, dignified and classy are attributes that pertain only to women. Ah, new exciting logic for them, uh, for Redneck University. Another says, I concur with every point made with one caveat. This conversation shouldn't be about women's body counts. It should be about a partner of either gender. And another says, it needs to be acknowledged that a high body count is just as disgusting in men as it is in women. Men who are virtuous and chaste should also be the one sought after too. Uh, Another says, of course, the misogynist who wishes that he was still in the 1940s focuses his whole body count diatribe on women. Uh, also, both men and women should care about body count, not just men caring about a woman's account. It's kind of gross on both parties. Do you like being used? And finally, Matt, I get tired of constant hyper-focus on criticizing women. That's why women become defensive. Society holds women to a higher standard while painting men as the victims. Okay, so let me make a few points about this. First, anyone who listened to the monologue knows that I did, in fact, stipulate at the end that obviously it's bad for men to be promiscuous also. You know, most of the same reasons apply. A promiscuous man has likely been exposed to, to and possibly contracted any number of disgusting diseases. A promiscuous man lacks self-control, lacks virtue, lacks self-respect, lacks dignity, and so on. And I did state this in the monologue, but of course the caveat that I offered there was ignored by the people who were determined to come away with the impression that I was being somehow unfair and sexist towards women. And I think for those people, <clears throat> the moment I entered into this conversation— uh, they they had already determined that. Like they, they had already determined that no matter what I say, it has to be sexist. Second, did I spend equal time explaining why high body counts are bad for men? Well, no, I didn't. And, and why? Well, because that's just not what the conversation was about. The point was specifically to explain why men care about high body counts. And that's been the debate in society, and it's what I was weighing in on. Not everything has to be equal all the time, Okay. Just because we spend a certain amount of time talking about one group of people, that doesn't mean that we need to give equal time to the other group. Neither should we generalize every conversation so that everything is about everybody and no group is ever specifically singled out. The demand for this kind of thing is it's immature and it's silly and it's childish. It's the sort of thing I deal with as a parent. You know, it's like when my kids are upset because a sibling got a slightly bigger piece of pie for dessert. I'm not going to sit there with a ruler and measure it all out exactly, precisely, equally. Sometimes you get the bigger slice. Sometimes you get the smaller slice. That's life. Not everything is equal. And when you insist on that kind of equality, it's not because you care deeply about fairness and justice. It's because you're being selfish and small-minded. Third, the idea that society is harsher and more critical towards women is simply wrong. In fact, it's delusional and laughable. And yet it's a narrative that you hear from people on the left and the right. You know, it's not that society criticizes women more. It's that in the last few years, society, some some segments of it anyway, have started criticizing women at all. You see, for a long time, nearly all of the lecturing, all of the holding accountable, all of the criticism was directed towards men. And that has started to shift ever so slightly in recent times. And the people who preferred the old way are reacting as though women have been entirely villainized. They haven't. Even with the slight uptick in criticism, still the group most often demonized, most often blamed, most often cast as the villains are men, specifically white, straight men. 
They're still the subject of most of the scolding, most of the finger pointing, most of the scapegoating. It's just that recently we've started to hear on occasion people speak up and say, uh, well, well, here's what women are doing wrong and, and here's what they need to do better too. See, see men, men have been hearing this message forever from everywhere. Women are not used to hearing it, certainly not so directly and bluntly. For a long time, you just never, you would never hear anyone stand up and say, women need to do this better. You especially would never hear any men, man say that. Even though, again, on the other side of it, for years, women were lecturing men that way all the time. So now uh, a little bit of that's going in the reverse, and we're acting as though it only ever goes in the reverse, which is not the case. Now, fourth, one of the reasons why it's necessary to specifically state that women shouldn't be promiscuous is that, on the other end, there are powerful cultural voices claiming that female promiscuity is an objectively good thing. The institutions in our country are heavily invested in the narrative that it's empowering for women to become sexually liberated and sleep with whoever they want, whenever they want. And this message doesn't really go the other way. There isn't nearly as much of a push to encourage men to be promiscuous. And you certainly don't hear anyone ever claiming that, uh, that it's empowering for a man to have sex with lots of women. Like, when's the last time you ever heard that? When's the last time you ever heard someone say that a man who's had sex with a lot of women is empowered? It, it doesn't happen. In fact, I'm not sure if I've ever heard anyone say that it's liberating for men to have sex with lots of women. That kind of encouragement only goes one way, which makes it especially important to counteract and speak out against it. This is the way it goes in modern society. Certain types of sins committed by certain groups of people are specially promoted and encouraged, and it then becomes necessary for those of us on Team Sanity to specially denounce those sins because they are being specially celebrated. When it comes to carrying your valuables or uh, self-defense items in your vehicle, most people feel that they have to choose between safety and convenience. Someone breaking into your car typically, typically is going to check the glove box under the seats, under the center console. Now we can outsmart them with the Headrest Safe, which gives you convenience and peace of mind. The Headrest Safe is exactly what it sounds like. You can replace your standard headrest in your car with their easy-to-access safe. To access the safe, you just pull the side part off, and then you can either use your fingerprint, use a key, or manually type in the code to open the safe. There's no way that uh, anyone could know your headrest safe is even there, and even if they did, there's no way that they could get it open without using one of the three methods to unlock it. The headrest safe has a universal design that allows it to fit all vehicles. And the best part is these come in a variety of colors to make the interior match the interior of your car. I have their black leather Vulcan headrest for uh, my vehicle. I love it. Depending on the day, I'll put my self-defense items, cash, or medication in the safe. Keeps me, uh, gives me peace of mind knowing that it will stay out of the hands of our kids, valets, or intruders. So what are you waiting for? Save $100 today at theheadrestsafe.com with promo code Walsh at checkout. That's theheadrestsafe.com, promo code Walsh. Fifth and finally, is it bad for men to sleep with lots of women? As established already, the answer is yes, obviously. Is it just as bad? Yes, in the sense that licentiousness is morally disordered, is sinful, and uh, no matter who's engaging in it, that remains the same. But is it just as much of a red flag? In other words, is it just as troubling of a sign when a man has a history of sleeping around as it is when a woman has a similar history? The answer there is no, it isn't. It's still bad for men. Men should not behave that way. Yet it isn't exactly the same. And this is the part of the conversation that, of course, will be misconstrued by the legions of morons who are determined to misconstrue it, but it's worth saying anyway. A high body count for a woman is indeed more of a red flag than it is for a man. It's a red flag for both, but the flag is a bit bigger, a bit, bit brighter, flies a bit higher with women. And there are many reasons for this. And I think most of this is like intuitive. I think people just understand this. But, but I'll, I'll mention one. Is that men are less emotional by nature. We form fewer attachments. And we form them more slowly. Um, so, so that makes it easier for a man to com compartmentalize. It's easier for him to take a more practical, utilitarian view of something, even his relationships. Men are also more visual in their attraction. We're attracted to looks more than women are. Now, obviously, it'll help a man attract a woman if he's a good-looking guy. But even if he has average looks, even if he's like ugly, he can make himself more physically attractive to women by being confident, by being uh, personable, by being funny, by being successful. Now, an ugly woman will have a harder time overcoming that deficit with personality alone because a man's initial attraction is based much more on visual cues. I mean, it's based 
almost entirely, at least initially, on visual cues. Uh, all this means that, that, that a man's wiring makes it easier for him to have casual sexual relationships. Doesn't make it, that doesn't make the behavior good. It doesn't make it any less sinful. It doesn't make it, quote, natural. It just means that it's an easier habit of behavior for a man to fall into. Women, on the other hand, are wired to be more emotional, to be more affectionate, to be more easily attached, less driven by raw, by raw physical visual attraction. And this makes it a sign of greater, more severe moral disorder when a woman has a high body count. In other words, she, she shouldn't even really be tempted to act that way. Like a life of casual sex should be more immediately and innately unappealing to her as a woman. This isn't even a temptation that she should really have. And so if she's living such a life, it speaks potentially to a deeper and more serious problem. Now, there are plenty of examples like this that go the other way. Like, for example, it's not good when women are overly sensitive, when they're quick to take offense, when they have poor control over their emotions. It's not good for women. Women shouldn't be that way, you know. Uh, but it's worse when men are that way. Bad for both, worse for men. Because it's a behavior that is even farther from the masculine ideal than it is from the feminine. It, it, it should be easier for a man to not to behave that way because that's not how he's wired, or at least it's not how he should be wired. That's why when a woman is too sensitive and she cries too much and she takes things too personally, men find it annoying. You know, it, it, it's annoying. But when a man is too sensitive and he cries too much and he takes things too personally, women find it repulsive. It's not just annoying. It's disgusting. It's like nauseating for, for a woman to see that from a man. That sort of thing can be, so, so like, just imagine, you know, you'll see sometimes a woman will, will like break down in tears because she's just very frustrated, very frustrating day, and she starts to cry. On the other hand, like, imagine a man breaking down in tears. You ask him, what's wrong? I don't know, I'm just so frustrated. It's such a frustrating day. I'm just overwhelmed that he's crying. Now, whatever we hear from society about a man should be more emotional, I guarantee it, almost every woman sees that, and they're not attracted to that man at all. That's gross. Like, get it together. That sort of thing could be a deal breaker from a woman's perspective. From a man's perspective, when a woman acts that way, you know, it's, it's not really a deal breaker. The behavior is bad for both groups, but it's but for one, it's more disgusting. It's more of a red flag. It's, it's not just a flaw for a man to be weak and teary and overly sensitive. It is specifically a feminine flaw. Feminine flaws in men are always going to be worse than feminine flaws in women. On the other hand, it is a flaw for, woman, for a woman to be crude and vulgar and to run around hooking up with random people and taking pride in her sexual conquests. But even worse, it is a masculine flaw. And masculine flaws will be more repulsive in women than they are in men. That's the nuance here. Easy to misinterpret, easy to take out of context and accuse me of saying things I'm not saying, but it is what it is. And those who deny this innately obvious point are there for today canceled. Hey, YouTube, thanks for listening to the show. If you'd like access to my full show with no ads, you should go to dailywire.com and use promo code Walsh to get two months free on all annual plans. See you there.